Long ago, the Orcish Horde was corrupted by the Burning Legion and lured to the world of Azeroth. For generations, the Orcs made war upon the human kingdoms of Stormwind and Lordaeron. Though the Horde was ultimately defeated, a visionary young warchief named Thrall rose to lead his people in their darkest hour. Under Thrall's rule, the Orcs freed themselves from the chains of demonic corruption and embraced their shamanistic heritage. After years of wandering, the Orcs founded their own kingdom in the harsh wastelands of Durotar. Based in the warrior city of Orgrimmar, they stand ready to destroy all who would challenge their supremacy. As a proud defender of Durotar, it is your duty to crush your enemies, both seen and unseen. For the nefarious agents of the Burning Legion still wander the land. Freedom, man. That's what it's all about. Speak, friend. <laughs> Groove on freedom, like the good book says. For the Horde! Welcome. You are listening to What on Earth is Happening. Strength and Honor. The show will discuss the topics of human consciousness, mind control, natural law, the occult, and all issues that affect the freedom of the people of Earth. What on Earth is Happening will endeavor to shine light on the darkness of our world and to offer empowering solutions to the problems we face as humanity approaches its critical moment of choice. And now, for the whole is your host, Mark Passio. Welcome. It is great to be here. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening, a new radio show on Revolution Broadcasting. I'm your host, Mark Patio, and um, before we get into the topic that we're going to discuss tonight, I want to make a few announcements about how the show is going to work. I want to send some thanks out to people that made this show happen, and uh, I'll give the call-in number. Maybe we'll get to some calls a little bit later. So, um... This show is going to be broadcast live on Tuesday evenings uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And it's going to be two hours. The second hour is going to be picked up by Revolution Broadcasting and aired on Thursday evening at 8 p.m. Okay, so the show is broadcast live on Tuesdays. Two-hour show. Second hour is going to be picked up by Revolution Broadcasting on Thursday evening at 8 p.m. So uh, tune in every thir- every Tuesday and Thursday at 8 p.m. on Revolution Broadcasting. My website, you can listen live to both hours there, is whatonearthishappening.com. That's whatonearthishappening.com. Okay, so I want to send out some thanks uh, to some people for making this show happen. The, the first person I want to thank is Bob Tuscan from theylie.com. And uh, he was really instrumental in helping me uh, get this show on the air. And uh, uh, an incredible amount of thanks go out to him for uh, all of his help in getting everything set up. I want to also thank Eric G. for introducing me to Bob and uh, basically setting the chain of events in motion that led to uh, me getting the show. 
So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to give you the call-in number, and uh, hopefully we'll get to uh, some callers a little bit later on this evening. The call-in number is 347-884-9417. That's 347-884-9417. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what I do and what um, we're going to be talking about here tonight. I give a presentation. Uh, uh, it's a slideshow presentation and lecture, and it's called What on Earth is Happening? And in it, I basically try to get to the root causal factors of the problem that humanity is experiencing as a species, to, to strike at the very root of these problems and understand enough about the nature of these problems so that we can basically go to work on solving them. Because ultimately that's what this is really all about. Many of us have recognized a lot of the problems that humanity faces, but not many of us really understand the causal nature of those problems, the absolute root core factors that are really contributing to those problems and uh, why we see them uh, manifesting in our, in our shared reality. So in order to get down to how these problems work, you need enough basic information about the nature of the problem. And once you have that, then you can move on to actually implementing solutions. So that's basically what we're going to talk about here tonight. We're going to uh, basically get to the heart, the very heart of the nature of the problems that we encounter uh, as a species and what's really taking place around us in the world. So the first thing I want to talk about, what this entire radio show is ultimately going to be about, is what is truth. We have to get down to the fundamental core of what truth is actually is and understand it enough because truth is intricately related to the problem of why we experience suffering in our world. It's completely inter intermeshed with that idea. Truth in, in the way that I look at it throughout my presentation and the way that it's going to be uh, dealt with on this radio program is essentially nothing more than that which is. That which has Strength actually and honor. undergone the process of actually occurring in our reality. Nothing more than that. For the whole. Events actually take place. They play out in our three-dimensional space-time reality. And that's what I'm calling truth. It isn't the understanding of the mind of God, so to say, or anything extremely esoteric. No it's simply events occur. We can understand those events. We can come to an understanding of what is actually taking place both within us and around us. And really that is the core reason of why we experience suffering in the world because we as a whole, as a collective consciousness, have really gone off the path of truth. We what are engaged in illusion. We are engaged in fantasy. We are engaged in <laughs> fundamental axioms, belief systems that we take as true, but which fundamentally are not true. And when we basically stay attached to these ideas and core axioms, we suffer as a result if they're not in alignment with what Dumb. actually is. So let me define what an axiom is. Because this is going to be critical uh, as we go forward and talk about concepts like this to understanding what is really taking place. An axiom is a statement or a proposition that is regarded as already having been established. It's, it's taken as true. It is uh, something that is accepted. It's, it's uh, uh, something that is considered self-evident to most people. Okay? Now, that could be a real problem if what that person takes as self-evident isn't actually what is. And trying to explain to a lot of people, as I'm sure most people who listen 
to, uh, to this network understand is once you start to take ideas to people that aren't including what, what they already consider to be true, it's a very difficult barrier to break down between you and the other person that you're trying to explain um, information to. So we're going to address that. Uh, we're going to basically talk about self-knowledge in this program because that is what we really need to get down to if we are not to be fooled, if we are not to take Drink. deception Look and tall. falsehood as truth in the world. We have to understand the self and what's going on in human consciousness. So as the introduction said, a big part Farewell. of what we're going to talk about on this radio program is human consciousness, how it works, what the qualities of consciousness are. We're going to talk about how consciousness manifests. It's, we're going to talk about how it has um, an expression through the physiology. Look and we'll get into the brain in this program. We'll get into some neuroscience in this program to understand how the human brain works. That's fundamentally important to understanding what's taking place in the world. So to get back to the idea of truth, uh, I want to read a quote by the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. He said that really there are only two ways that people are ever fooled in the world. May your blades never dawn. One is that they believe that which is not true. They, they accept something that has no basis in actual reality. So they accept ideas or propositions that are not true. The second way that people are fooled is that they refuse to accept that which is true and is actually taking place around them. And Kierkegaard basically said these are the only ways that people are really ever fooled in the world, that, that they uh, experience manipulation. And I would take this statement even a step further, and I would say that there, these are really the only two reasons that humanity ever really experiences suffering. Those are the two reasons that humanity experiences suffering. They believe that which is not true, and they refuse to accept that which is true. So th that could be another topic of discussion, and we could get a dialogue going about this a little bit later. Now, um, the, the next thing I want to talk about is manipulation and deception. Okay? Th these go to work on us on a daily basis, as many of us know, to basically pull us away from the truth and to get us to not see the truth, get us to not see what is right there in front of our eyes, in plain sight, so to speak. Um, Adolf Hitler, the Supreme Chancellor during the Third Reich in Nazi Germany, he made a statement and he said, make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually the people will believe it. Make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually you'll get people to accept it. Now think about that. You have to make the lie big. It has to be about something that everyone thinks about, that everyone values in life. It has to be about general concepts that, that people accept, that people take into themselves and then base their life upon. Hitler's minister of propaganda during the Third Reich was a Paul Joseph Goebbels. And he made a statement that is actually even more sinister than Hitler. He said, the bigger the lie, the more it will be believed. The bigger deceivers make the lie, the more people are likely to accept it into their fundamental makeup. Imagine that. And this is true. And we're going to talk about some of these big lies as we move forward on this radio program. And, um, 
another thing that we're basically going to do is we, we, we really want to understand, again, self-knowledge. That's going to be the way out of the mess that we're in. Once we recognize the problems, the solution really lies in understanding who we really are. Who we really are. And the only way you can do that is if you have enough knowledge of yourself, how your own consciousness works, and how to bring that consciousness to a place of balance. So I want to read another quote by, uh, th this is an inscription that is written on the Oracle of Delphi in Greece from uh, the, the, the Greek mystery traditions, schools of consciousness and, um, and uh, re people who deeply studied and reflected upon the nature of consciousness and self. Here's the quote. Heed these words, you who wish to probe the depths of nature. If you do not find within yourself that which you see, neither will you find it outside of yourself. If you ignore the wonders of your own house, how do you expect to find other wonders? In you is hidden the treasure of treasures. Know thyself, and you will know the universe and the gods. Know thyself, and you will know the universe and the gods. Now this, this statement reflects a fundamental core truth about the nature of reality that we, are, that we are embedded in. It says, if you know the self, you will know the universe. So, moving from the very small to the very large, and knowledge about one reflects knowledge about the other. This says something about the nature of our reality. It says that our reality is self-similar across scales. It is fractal in nature. Okay? It is holographic in nature. Hologram is an image that you can keep breaking apart down into smaller and smaller elements. Yet within each element, if you cut a hologram in half, you don't get half uh, an image. You get a whole image at a slightly lower level of re re resolution. But nonetheless, the entire image is present. The universe works the same way. If you understand enough about the constituent elements of the universe, meaning the individual consciousness that comprise it, you understand about the whole of nature. So, why do people not understand this principle? Why do they not know the same? Why are we experiencing all the types of problems that we are experiencing based on the fact that people do not understand themselves, that they do not understand the nature of their own consciousness. But moreover, we go back to the fundamental things that people value or, or accept and how that dictates the quality of their life. If, if you did this as a social experiment, let's say you had about 20 or 30 individuals, and you ask them, tell me, list the three things that you value above everything else in life. Just list the three things that you think are the most critical to your life and the quality of your life. Now, I guarantee you, get an extremely diverse um, amount of answers. You, they would be all across the board. They would range from family to health to money to, uh, you know, possessions to um, just general religion, general concepts in life. But I, I would almost guarantee you, I would almost be willing to bet anything on the fact that you did this social experiment even with many people around you, you would not get back the answer truth from many people. And this is why we're in the mess that we're in as, as a whole, as a people. People have lost the idea that truth 
is valuable, that it means something in relationship to the experience of their lives, that it dictates the quality of that which they experience in their lives. And again, these two things are fundamentally interwoven and cannot be separated from each other. When we are in alignment with what is, and we are in alignment with what is and what is true, and we speak the truth and we live according to truth. And, and by that I mean natural law and moral law, and we're going to talk about those things. Then the quality of our experience improves and we don't suffer. If, however, the nature of our lives varies in accordance with what is truth, then we experience suffering in proportion to the amount that we go off the path of truth. And that is how it works. It really does work like that. That is a fundamental law of nature. And many people refuse to accept that as a fundamental law of nature. You know, just like gravity is a law of nature, it doesn't matter whether you believe in it. If you step off a cliff, you're going to experience the result of what the law of gravity will do to the body, whether you believe in it or not. It's really kind of irrelevant whether you believe in a natural law because it's in place and you're bound by it. What are you looking for? Now, that, that could mean you can choose to ignore it, but you're going to suffer proportionally to the amount that you ignore that law. And th this is going to lead me into another concept I, uh, I want to bring out the difference between two forms of not knowing because I'm going to talk a lot about natural law and how natural law no works time. throughout this program and programs that we do into the future. We're going to delve into the nature of the problems uh, deeply and we're going to look at we're going to look into the darkness certainly. We're not going to ignore anything that other people consider negative. Spring. We will be talking about the, the, the core nature of, of the problem. But I want to address why people largely don't understand this primarily. What is the difference between nescience and ignorance? Is there a difference between nescience and what ignorance? Do you mean? Nescience is kind of like a formal, a formal term for ignorance or uh, general not knowing. It means not knowing. Now, there is a difference between nescience and ignorance. Nescience is not knowing Go for or not understanding victory. something that you wouldn't really be reasonably expected to know or understand. Ignorance is deliberately turning aside from something that you can be reasonably expected to know or understand. Hence the word ignorance. Ignore. You are deliberately choosing not to look at that which is, which is right in front of you, or which is easily able to be understood and okay, taken okay. in by you with a minimal amount of effort. And I would argue that humanity in today's world does not exist in a state of nescience because there is a profound amount of knowledge in the world. There is an unbelievable amount of information out there on every topic imaginable. Bookstores are full. There are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of documentaries available out there. People are lecturing constantly in all cities, at all times and places. There is just, there's so much, it's, it's almost overkill, the amount of information that is out there. And yet you still have people that just don't want to know. They don't want to look at the truth because of how ugly it has become. 
because of how much we have descended in consciousness and become something that really humanity um, probably should never have become and does not need to stay in this state for really a moment longer. The knowledge is all around us. It's all there. It's a matter of whether we will reach out and take it. And it's also a matter of once some of us understand the information that is out there, so, some of us understand the truth, how much will we be willing to fearlessly take it to others around us? How many of us would be really willing to speak the truth into existence and really bring it to other people who need to understand it, whether that may be uncomfortable for us or not. Because it kind of creates sometimes oppositional circumstances between people. And, um, you know, family members can come to, come to, to uh, um, a, an oppositional relationship when it comes to um, one person trying to bring information that another, another person may not necessarily be willing to look at. And that's a, another dynamic that I want to address as uh, we go forward on this radio show. So the next thing I really want to do is, and, and for a, probably a good amount of the remainder of uh, this first hour of the show, I want to bring up the concept that in my presentation – and, and on this show, I'm going to be referring to as the biggest lie. The biggest lie, okay? There's one lie that is really bigger than any other that is ever told. And it is the most dangerous ideology that basically exists. Okay. And this is the ideology. I'm, I'm going to tell you what the name of it. There actually is a name for it. I don't give it that name in my presentation, but on the show I want to actually tell you what the name of this ideology is called because, and we're going to get into it in depth, because this is one of the most fundamental ideologies, believe it or not, in the Western world. As difficult as that may be for some people to believe, this ideology is so prevalent and it's so insidious that you, you will find it out there. You, you have discussions with people, people who you would least expect to hold this uh, general ideology. You'll find that they believe this, and they're unwilling to accept anything else, um, no matter how much uh, contradictory ev evidence is brought to their attention. And this ideology is called solipsism. Solipsism. Now, many will be hearing this word for the first time because it's not generally talked about as a philosophy or an ideology. So a lot of people don't know what it is. Okay? So I'm going to read a basic definition of what solipsism is and then get into this because this is the biggest lie and this is the main deception that manipulators really use and they, they want people to unknowingly and unwittingly accept the, the philosophy of solipsism, even if it's in the back of their minds. And ma many people are solipsists and don't even really know it. They don't even really understand that that's the ideology that they subscribe to. And uh, I'll, I'll give an anecdote after I get into it a little bit about uh, some solipsists that I have met in my uh, travels and in uh, uh, dealing with some people even in the, uh, the, the truth and freedom movements. So what solipsism is, is it's the philosophical notion that one's own mind is really all that exists and that one's perceptions are equated to reality and truth, okay? So your perceptions are all that there is. The contents of your mind, your perceptions, that's all that exists. And if you believe that, you might as well turn this show off right now because there's nothing that I or anyone else can really say that could dissuade you from your course. 
However, this is the biggest lie. There is no more dangerous ideology than the notion that there is no such thing as truth. This is the, um, this is the ideology that is placed out there to dissuade people from ever really going on the journey, from ever really stepping onto the spiritual path in life and the path toward truth. Because if you can convince someone that there really is no truth, that it's all relative, that it's all based on people's perceptions, no matter how erroneous, no matter how in completely straying from natural law principles their perceptions may be, then you really have them where you want them to begin to manipulate their sense of reality. That's the biggest lie. What, what kind of ideology, before we even get into wh where this ideology leads, let's look at, let's look at some of the tenets, the basic tenets of solipsism. Okay? Solipsism basically states that th there essentially is no reality. There, there is no actual experiences. It's all just one person's perception. In other words, if my mind ceases to exist in the universe, nothing really exists to a solipsist. It, it's all just a fleeting thing in between the time when, when, what, when someone is born and the time of the child, and nothing really matters. And, and the second tenet is, even if something exists, you know, it, it's basically saying, okay, if tenet number one is somehow miraculously disproven and proved that something actually exists, nothing can actually be known about it. So there's no such thing as knowledge. Knowledge doesn't exist to a solipsist. Okay? There's no such thing as knowledge. Okay? So there's no, su there's no truth. That's the first tenet. There's no such thing as the way things are. There's no truth. There's no such thing as knowledge. In other words, even if you could come to an understanding in your own mind of uh, 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 a, the way natural law works, even if you could come to an understanding of something in itself, um, you, you, I'm sorry, even if you could understand that something exists, you could not really understand anything about it in fullness. And then the third tenet of solipsism is, even if something could be known about it, okay, you take some kind of natural law, you take some kind of basic principle, you take a, a thing or an object or a, a, a fundamental quality of consciousness, and even if you could get to the truth about any of those things, you could understand something and actually know any information fully about it, you could never actually really communicate that to any other living being. That knowledge about anything cannot really be communicated to other beings. Now, this ideology, in my understanding, is about as close to the conception of hell as it gets. Nothing exists. Even if something were to exist, you can never know, really know anything about it. And even if you were to somehow come into knowledge about it, it is impossible to take that knowledge and communicate it to anyone else. And what I would say is, this is the biggest lie. This is the lie that manipulators really want to to other people, because that means they'll never begin the awakening process. The awakening process takes one initial leap of faith. Only one. One and only one. And that leap of faith is that you must initially believe that there is truth to be found on the journey. Otherwise, you will never set foot on that path. If you believe there is no such thing as the truth, it doesn't matter about anything else that takes place around you because you will never actually, for yourself, look into anything. You believe you're not, you're not capable of understanding truth. You'll never start looking into it for yourself. And if you buy the third tenet, that even if you were to understand it, you can never really truly communicate it to anyone else, 
you'll never really begin speaking the truth to anyone else. And that's why this is the most dangerous and insidious ideology on the face of the earth. And it's called solipsism. Remember that word, look into it. And there are more solipsists out there than you would even believe. I know that may be difficult for some people in the friendly listening audience that uh, listens here on Revolution Broadcasting and the people that come to uh, my site, whatonearthishappening.com. However, that is the case. There are a lot of solipsists out there. And I, I, I work with a group in the Philadelphia area called Truth, Freedom, Prosperity. I attend a lot of their meetings. They're, they're activists and um, they're people who actively are truth seekers and uh, people who are really trying to turn the tide in the dynamic that we're experiencing right now. And even, I, I go out to some of their meetings and even some people that come out to hear uh, ideas that are expressed in a group like this, I've heard the notion that there is really no such thing as truth, even in groups like that, uh, which is a, a disheartening thing to hear in the truth and freedom movements. Um, you would think, why would anybody be out at a group called Truth, Freedom, Prosperity if they believed there was no such thing as truth and it was all about individual perceptions? See, the idea that perception is reality is something that many people really want to propagate and embed in the consciousness of people. But perception is not reality. The quality of our experience is dictated by how closely aligned our perceptions come with truth. And that our goal in life needs to be to bring our perceptions into harmony with truth, with, with that which is. Okay, so we're not constantly engaged in fantasy, so that we're not constantly ignoring that which is going on around us. And more importantly, we're not ignoring that which is going on with in us because that's really where this is all being driven from and you're not going to hear me too much talk about the highest level of the control element that's going on you're not going to hear me get into hatred toward those people who are really up at the highest level of the uh the the, the conspiratorial um, pyramid. Because I don't hold a lot of um, bitterness or anger toward those people. In a lot of ways, they are united with themselves, at least. In a very sick, twisted, and dark way, they're united with themselves. See, they're beings that, as they think, so they feel, and so they act as twisted as their actions may be, they're still in unity at least with themselves. And that's why they're successful at what they do. That's why they have and have had up to this point a largely easy time at manipulating the rest of us. Because most of us are not, cannot make that same claim. We can't make that same claim, sadly. That as we think, so we feel, and so we act in unison. And there is no contradiction between those three modalities of our consciousness in our lives. Many of us cannot really make that statement. We take actions that we know in, our, in the knowledge that we carry and in our emotions, how we feel about it. We know and understand that essentially those actions are not what we should be doing, yet for whatever reasons or justifications, we take those actions anyway. And that's how we get off the path of truth, and that, again, is why we suffer. And it, we really can't bring those three aspects of ourself, our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions, into alignment unless we understand enough about ourselves and how we work. And that's why the manipulators of this world are really so successful. They understand how consciousness works. They understand 
how natural law works. They understand how the principles of truth work. They decided to take that knowledge and use it as a weapon against other people that they wish to control and put under their thumb. Because if you can take so, so much knowledge out of general circulation and you can hide it, you can occult that knowledge. And that's all the word occult means. And we'll be talking about a lot about the occult. We'll be talking about different occult systems, different ide occult ideologies and beliefs, different occult groups as this show progr progresses over the weeks. All the word occult means is hidden. It comes from the Latin. A again, another thing I'm going to be doing a lot on this show is we'll be free-forming ideas. We'll, we'll be throwing different concepts out there. But what, one thing I really am going to be doing a lot is getting into the meaning of words and what getting into I how words mean? control people. We are controlled through words more than any other methodology. Believe it or not, that's true. The word occult is derived from Latin, and when to do this as an experiment, just play a general word association game with people. Say occult, and then tell the person, tell me the first word that comes to your mind when I say that word. And I guarantee you, you can do this a hundred times, I guarantee you at least 90% of the time, the first word that is going to come back in a word association Be game seeing, yeah. with other people, if you say the word occult, you will get back the word evil. Almost guaranteed. Try it. This is what manipulators so, so. want you to think of as the occult. Okay? All it is is knowledge that has been hidden. It comes from the Latin verb occultare. Occultare means to hide or to conceal. That's it. So the word occult is derived from Latin, and all it means is that which is hidden from sight. Nothing more, nothing less. There is no connotation on whether it is for good purposes or Go for evil purposes. To victory. And that's another distinction that we're going to make in this radio program. What is the difference between understanding and wisdom? What is the difference between knowledge and properly applied knowledge? See, to know something, and many people that, that are listening to this show and many people throughout the world have a lot of knowledge. What can they I do know for you? a lot about what is going on. However, that's only the first step. Having knowledge can be helpful, and having knowledge can be Stop. useless. Knowledge is simply information, okay? And what matters isn't necessarily having the knowledge, accurate information about what is. That's knowledge. However, what really makes knowledge important Knowledge in itself isn't power. What you do with what you know really imbues knowledge with power. That's when it becomes actively applied knowledge. And that is done through our actions. Once you know, what are you going to do with what you know? And hopefully... This program will be an inspiration for some people to really begin using the most powerful device, the most powerful agency, the most powerful force in the known universe. And that is the power of the human voice. That is the most powerful force in the universe. The voice is the greatest gift that we have ever been given, and it can serve a dual purpose. Because the manipulators of this Look world, tar. they're using their voice 24-7.
and they're using it for deception and manipulation and the propagation of lies and in particular the biggest lie that there's no truth don't even bother Go going forth to victory. after all you can't know it you, you don't have the ability to really know and understand what is going on and what is taking place around you and more importantly they want you to identify with the fact that you can't really know what's going on inside of yourself in your own consciousness so um, knowledge properly applied in the world that is what wisdom is and that's what makes knowledge good or bad used for good to elevate human consciousness or used for evil purposes to spread deception and to keep people um, ignorant and to keep people under control so um, no topics are going to be considered taboo on this show there is no such thing as negative information this is where I come to a, a, a great um, divergence with some new age schools of thought I'm not a new age um, uh, subscriber in this regard okay there is no such thing as negative information as a matter of fact one of the worst things that I think that we can do is refuse to engage the truth no matter how ugly it is if we refuse to look at our own shadow at the darkness that dwells in our own individual consciousnesses and in our own hearts then we're really not going to get very far on the journey that we're on and we're not really going to get to the heart of the matter we have to be willing to look into that heart of darkness and confront it because th there's really no escape from the situation uh, hate to break the news to most people but there's no escape from the situation that we've worked ourselves into as a species there really is no escaping it the way out of this uncomfortable situation is to go through it not around it not under it not over it not turning your back and walking in the other direction it doesn't work like that the way out is to go through the problems that we've created by confronting them and the only way to do that is to look at oneself the answer lies in the mirror and that's going to be the focus of what this show is really ultimately all about we are going to this show is going to be a process of self-examination above all else self-examination the more self-knowledge we have about how we work and why we fundamentally do the things that we do and why we fundamentally behave in the ways that we do until we have enough information about that really are in a position to start to accept things for the best and, and moving it towards the solution. There does have to be knowledge first. Otherwise, we'd be running around like chickens with our heads cut off, not really knowing what's going on, not really knowing what's going on within us, most importantly. So, um, let's uh, further break some of these ideas down and get into the... Um, let me get into what human consciousness really is ultimately about. We have a threefold nature to our consciousness. Maybe it would help first, but let's talk about what consciousness is. Consciousness is really the solution to the problems that we face. It's the solution for not being deceived anymore. It's the solution for not being able to be externally controlled by other people anymore. Consciousness is the solution to ultimately all the problems that we face as a species. Because if we don't have consciousness, we're wandering in the dark. We are wandering in base levels of awareness. You, you never really know the difference between truth and falsehood if you're at a low vibrational consciousness. You know, somebody can come along with any lie or any made-up notion, and they can hold it out there as bait, and you're, you'd be willing to, to bite it and buy it. You know, again, uh, as we said, 
uh, are we really being sold the lies that we're uh, living in? Did we really, were we really sold them? Or did we buy them willingly? That's a question we all really need to ask ourselves. Were we so hungry for someone to take responsibility for us? For someone to think for us? For someone to solve problems for us? That we were willing to lay aside our personal responsibility and most of all, our responsibility to, to understanding the truth. Were we willing to lay that aside and just say, okay, I'll take your solution. Well, you, you, all you have to do is put it out there, and I accept. Uh, I'll buy it. I think the latter is certainly the case. That we really weren't sold the mess that we're in. We bought it hook, line, and sinker. And the only way to really get out of that that modality of being in the world is to raise consciousness. That's what the solution ultimately is. Every problem contains in, it, in itself the seed of its own solution. And that seed is human consciousness. Now, consciousness, how I'm going to use it, and again, not just tonight, but throughout the entire show, the, the definition that I'm going to use for consciousness, when I say consciousness, what I'm talking about is it's our ability to recognize patterns that are going on with respect to the events that are taking place around us. And not just around us, but also inside of us. You know, the internal patterns that take place within the body, within the mind, within our feelings. That's what consciousness is about, being able to recognize patterns and meaning. What do those patterns mean? Not just that they are there, but then why are they there? The question why has to be addressed all the time. That's what consciousness really is. It's looking at something and it's asking the question why. Why is it like this? Why is this the fundamental nature of this thing or this problem or this event. So consciousness is our ability to recognize patterns and meaning with respect to the events that are taking place both within us and around us. That's all I'm really referring to when I refer to human consciousness. And consciousness what can you either be raised through knowledge or never it can be manipulated through knowledge. And that is what we're going to really get into when we start getting into occult methodologies for controlling consciousness. And that's by any name that you get it, that is mind control. And that's what, going to be one of the central focuses of this show as we move forward. I'm going to talk about mind control and its methodologies. Because if someone doesn't understand the methodologies of mind control, they don't really have the tools to understand the ways that they may be actively being manipulated by other people who do not have their best intentions at heart. So we have to know the methodologies of mind control. And mind control works on multiple fronts. There's so many different methodologies of it. There are, I, I, and I'm largely talking about mass mind control. There, there's something called trauma-based mind control, which we're probably going to do a full show on. However, what I'm Lucky largely Ducky. talking about is mass mind control. Mind control that goes to work on large populations of people based on programming into them the fundamental axioms, the core belief systems that people fundamentally take as true and then act upon as if they are true. That's what mind control is. And um, we, we have to be aware of how it works. And again, it's, it's a multifaceted set of techniques. That's what mind control is. It works through very, very powerfully through words. 
So Try understanding it. the words that we speak, understanding language is a huge part of mind control. I don't know whether anyone is familiar with something called neuro-linguistic programming, which is about word choice and speech patterns related to embedding ideas in people's consciousness so that they act in certain ways. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the use of symbolism for mind control. Symbolism is an archetypal language. It is a language that if we don't understand the building blocks of and the syntax of, then we are completely vulnerable to its manipulation at a subconscious level. So we'll be getting into symbolism a lot on this program. We'll be talking about um, frequency, the use of colors, and, uh, and um, we'll be getting into the use of shapes and forms and how all of these come together in a cohesive way and are used to influence the thoughts and ultimately be used as a mechanism to subvert consciousness and control it. It, it, it really is, it's more than mind control. It's consciousness control is what the human species is basically under. It is the manipulation and control of the three forms, of the three experiential forms of human consciousness, which we're going to get into in a, in a few moments. So I want to do a couple of things. Uh, the, the first hour is going to be winding down soon. I want to give out again the call-in number for this program and encourage people to call in during the second hour. I basically largely laid out a lot of concepts during this first hour in a, in a short amount of time. So let's have some callers call in on the call-in line, and uh, let's take some calls in the second hour if we can. The number to call in is 347-884-9900. So go ahead and start calling that, and uh, I'll take some calls during the second hour of the broadcast tonight. The number again is 347-884-9417. My website is whatonearthishappening.com, and um, again, this show is going to be live on Tuesday evening, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, and it's going to be live on revolutionbroadcasting.com for the first hour. The second hour feed will be picked up by Revolution Broadcasting, and it will be broadcast on Thursday evening from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. So let's uh, wrap up the show with the first hour of the show with uh, an explanation of the two basic ways that consciousness breaks down and manifests. And essentially, these are in an internal feminine manifestation and in an external masculine manifestation. So I'll say that one more time. Consciousness, there is essentially two seemingly opposite qualities. However, they are really not opposite. They are really unified, and they, are, they dance with each other is a good way to look at it, okay? They're, they're actually embraced, and they form the whole, the quality of the whole of consciousness. There is an internal, an indwelling feminine manifestation, and then there is an external masculine manifestation of consciousness. Now, different spiritual systems have given these different names, okay? Uh, for example, you can look in uh, Taoism, and in Taoism, they're called yin and yang, okay? Yin is the internal um, feminine. It's a, it's a passive quality. It's an intuitive quality. It is, it is uh, more compassionate or submissive, and it is associated with the right brain. Okay, the right brain hemisphere, large capacity to center, yin quality. Uh, in in um, different occult traditions, let's say in um, in uh, Kabbalah, you have the, the paths of severity and mercy. Okay, so this would be like the, the mercy quality in Kabbalah. 
okay? It is the, the, the feminine aspect. Now, you have, you have um, the external male quality of consciousness, and that's, in Taoism, that would be called the yang quality in consciousness. This would be the more dominant or um, uh, analytical, the logical side. This would be a male element, and it would be more associated with the left brain hemisphere, okay? So we could look at uh, this in relationship to Freemasonry, for example. You have the two pillars in Freemasonry. You have the pillar of Joaquin leading to the sun, which could be considered the yang energy or the masculine quality of consciousness. The, the, the pillar of Boaz leads to the moon. That would be the feminine quality of consciousness. Okay, so we'll get into this uh, a little bit more in hour number two. In hour number two, I want to take... Uh, calls from from listeners and discuss some of the ideas that I talked about during hour one, particularly uh, uh, the, the concept of what truth is. I want to talk about the dangerous ideology of solipsism and get your thoughts on that. And we'll get more into the breakdown of human consciousness um, during the, thir the, uh, the second hour of the program tonight. So I'm going to wrap up this hour. Um, this show has been What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio. Listen here every Tuesday and Thursday night at revolutionbroadcasting.com at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. My website is whatonearthishappening.com. We'll be right back for the second hour. Freedom, man. That's what it's all about. You've got to groove on freedom, like the good book says. Welcome. You are listening to What on Earth is Happening. This show will discuss the topics of human consciousness, mind control, natural law, the occult, and all issues that affect the freedom of the people of Earth. What on Earth is Happening will endeavor to shine light upon the darkness of our world and to offer empowering solutions to the problems we face as humanity approaches its critical moment of choice. And now, here is your host, Mark Passio. Okay, welcome. This is What on Earth is Happening, and I'm your host, Mark Passio. Uh, where we left off the last show, we were talking about human consciousness, and we were talking about the ways that consciousness manifests. We were discussing the internal feminine quality of human consciousness and how that compares and contrasts with the external manifestation, the masculine uh, manifestation of human consciousness. So... Let's get right back into that, and maybe we'll take some calls later in the hour. So I was talking about yin consciousness, yin energy. This is lunar. It's associated with uh, the moon, okay, symbolically. And it's feminine. It's a feminine energy because it is indwelling, okay? This is an internal aspect of, of our consciousness, of our makeup. It's intuitive. Okay? It is, it's a passive element. It isn't very active. It, 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 it's uh, associated with, with the night. Okay? And basically, this quality of consciousness is directly related to our emotions. Our emotions are the internal quality of consciousness within us. The yang consciousness, the male energy, 
the masculine form of consciousness. It's solar. That's, that's the, the symbolic uh, way that it is depicted as the sun. It is an active quality. It's logical and analytical, and it is dominant. Okay? It is not passive or submissive. It, it is a more aggressive or dominant energy. And this energy is all about our actions in the world. This is all about how we make our consciousness manifest to others through our actions. You've heard the saying, you will know them by their actions. And that is certainly true. Um, we have to strive, if we want to become more conscious, to bring these two qualities into unison and balance with each other within ourselves. So, we have to strive to become beings that, as we feel, so we take action. And that our actions aren't in contradiction or opposition with how we really feel inside. So if I feel something is wrong, is not morally correct, is not morally justifiable, and I do it anyway, for whatever reason, the, the reason does not matter. I'm in opposition with myself doesn't make a difference what the reason is. Justifications and excuses really at the end of the day do not hold any water. Okay? That's all they are is justifications and excuses. If we continue to take actions that we actually believe aren't morally justified, aren't really, we really should not be doing, we know that deep down inside then we are in a state of internal opposition with ourselves, with our own consciousness. And for that very reason, that is why we're largely experiencing the, the negative and uncomfortable and often painful situations that we're experiencing in the world today. Because we are in a state of internal opposition with ourselves. We have to strive to make these two qualities into one within us. And there's many different methodologies for doing that. I'm going to get into eventually on this show practical grassroots solutions for affecting real change in, in our lives. But I, I want to talk about, again, briefly, the idea that there is a solution for every problem that is out there. There really is a solution. And th there's a formula for problem solving. That's what we're ultimately really looking for. We're really striving to find the solution to this problem. And you can know all you want about the problem. You can learn more and more and more and more about the chains that you're held in. But ultimately, if you're not looking for the way out of those chains, what is the difference how much you know about the chains? Okay? It's a step. It is a first step. You do have to understand how the problems manifest. Okay? But we ultimately have to strive for solutions. Yeah. And the way we get down to that problem solving is by finding enough information about the ultimate nature, the core nature of the problem. And the core nature of the problem that we face is we do not ultimately know ourselves. We do not ultimately know enough about human consciousness and the way it works. And that is a manipulator's dream scenario. If you have a person or a group of people who do not really understand how they work. They don't understand how their mind works. They don't under, really understand how their emotional makeup works. Maybe they're not a very emotionally developed person. Okay? You're in a position 
to completely manipulate and control their behavior because you know more about their makeup and how they work than they do. And I guarantee you, think, think of it like this. Here's a great metaphor for this. Imagine Be a safe. psychologist who has studied the human mind and the psyche more than anyone. Let's say this is one of the most advanced psychologists that has ever lived. He has done more work and delving into the human psyche than anyone else before him. Let's say he had a friend that for whatever reason, you can make up whatever reason you want, he started really despising. He had some kind of a, pro a problem with him. Maybe he became aware that the friend did something to him behind his back and he really wanted to get back at that person, okay? How much of a number do you think a psychologist like that would be able to do with a person that he became very close to and became close with in life. How much of a number, knowing what he knows about the mind and the psyche, do you think he would be able to do on that other individual? I guarantee you he could practically make life a living hell for him. And that's ultimately what the nature of the problem that we're faced with in the world today is really all about. You could look at the manipulators of this world. You could look at the occultists, the dark occultists of this world who use their knowledge of how the uh, natural law systems of consciousness work in this world. They use them as weapons against people who do not possess that knowledge. And that places them in a position of higher ground in warfare. And you know what happens when someone gets the higher ground. You know, you can look at it like a chess game. Chess of different elements, you know, coming together for someone to really be an excellent chess player. You have to really know the game. You have to know how the laws of the game work, right? You can't just make moves wherever you want. You have to know, what, you know, how the pieces move on the chessboard. This could be called natural law. Natural law is simply how the system that we're in does work. Whether we believe it, accept it, or not, there are laws that bind this place that we are inextricably bound to and by. And if we break them, we suffer. And if we come into harmony with them, if we harmonize with them, then we don't suffer. That will be a hard, bitter pill to swallow for many people, but nonetheless, it is a case. Now, a good chess player understands that, you know, he, he understands how the pieces move and the, the moves that they're capable of making, but he has other qualities in his arsenal. He has a knowledge of the opponent, knowledge of the opponent. A good chess player has to know who he's sitting down and playing against. He has to know whether they know as much about the game as he does. He has to know what their strategy is. More importantly, he has to know what their motivations are. He has to know what really drives them. What are they thinking? Do I understand what they're really wanting to do? Because if I do, then I could stay several steps ahead of them. He has to have a sense of timing, to know when to make certain moves. Okay? And he definitely has to be able to put out whatever is necessary to get the job done. So he has to have a, a sense of duty, if you like, or a call to sacrifice. You might need to sacrifice certain pieces to put yourself in a position uh, where you want to be. And uh, I think um, we'll, we'll talk about different events throughout history as human sacrifices. We'll, we'll get into 9-11 as a human sacrifice event to advance an agenda forward in this game that's being played. And we'll get into that in, in weeks ahead. So, this is the, these are the qualities that go into playing a, a good game of chess. That's, that's the necessary formula. And I would suggest that the manipulators of the world 
have all of these qualities and to a very great extent most of the people that they are um, working against that they are attempting to control do not have many of these qualities in place as a matter of fact most people don't even know there's a game being played Strength. and haven't even shown up. What can so I help what you? What this show is going to be a call to is trying to get more of those people to show up victory. at the game board and uh, hopefully work our way up to a higher position so we are not pawns in the game being played. Okay? We can't let ourselves be played in this game like pawns. See, we have to become the masters of this game. The chess master isn't on the board. The chess master isn't on the game board floor. Right? When you sit down, if you're a chess master, you're not, you're not actually walking onto the board. You're sitting down in a chair, and your p perspective is higher than the board. You can look down on the oh. board because you're at a higher level. That's what we need to become. See, sadly, most people are those pieces. Be safe. Most people are those pieces. And most people are the pawns in the game. And don't even know What it. do you need? They don't even know that they have strings tied to them. And they're, where they're being Strength. told to move is a completely controlled function. And the chess master is moving them at his discretion oh, and at his own blades will. never dull. Most people never ever see the strings that have them tied down. And they never see that they're a pawn in that game. That they're wanderers Speak, on that board. You know, that checkered board. We'll talk about the symbolism of the checkered floor. For the whole the black and white squares. Right? That's the game board floor where if you're on it and that's your level of consciousness, you don't know that you're being played. And you're basically a piece that is being positioned by a master who exists at a level much higher than you. You're a wanderer. You don't really know which is th those, those black and white squares representing light and dark. You really don't know which is which. You know, it's all from your perspective. You can only see one or maybe two squares ahead of you, but you can't see the whole game. You can't pull back and see the whole picture. And that's what ultimately I'm trying to get people to do, is pull back, see the really bigger picture. Not even from the box that most of us bring to the table, because many of us bring boxes to the table when it comes to looking at what really is and looking at the truth. We want to, uh, some of us may even want to look at what the truth is, but we want, we strive to fit it into the pre-existing ways that we had of looking at reality. We try to say, well, Blood and thunder. I previously thought this, and I now have taken in this new information. How can I get it to jive with the uh, belief system that I previously held, okay? And a big, big part of this will be religion. Okay? This is something that there, there's so much evidence that this is a, a manipulation in the form of mind control. And yet you hear many people that never want to admit to that and who don't look into the basis and the, the formulation of their religions and how that is also a form of mind control. So people bring different boxes to the table the boxes are of all shapes and sizes and colors and, and materials, but uh, newsflash, the truth does not fit in a box. So if you're bringing a box to the table, eventually, at some point, this show is going to make you feel uncomfortable. And I want it to do that because the truth, again, does not fit in a box. And anybody trying to stuff it into a box is going to be sorely disappointed. So let's get back into our discussion about self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is what we need. We need consciousness, the ability to recognize patterns of information, 
the ability to recognize what is taking place both within us and around us in the external reality that we experience and share with others. So consciousness at its core has a dual nature of internal feminine qualities and external masculine qualities. How this manifests in each individual, in each individual unit of consciousness, let's call it, in different uh, mystical traditions, uh, the, the word monad is often used. The one that is the expression of the all. And there are many monads. Each individual has their own unique uh, expressed consciousness even though we're all part of the one unified ocean of consciousness that exists in, in the universe. But getting down to the breakdown of the monad, the individual unit of consciousness, or an individual being, there are basically three expressions. And if you sit and really think about this, you really give it some deep thought. There really are only three ways that your consciousness can express itself in the reality that we live in. Think about it. You really can only experience three different manifested forms of consciousness. The ways that you make yourself known to other people. And these are through your thoughts, your emotions, and your actions. Your thoughts your emotions and your actions. The thoughts can be looked at as the primary expression of consciousness. They are an emanation. Okay? They're not really male or female. They are they just are. They're not an internal nor an external manifestation. They are an essence. So that's a fundamental basis of consciousness, thought activity. Look at that as our creator aspect. Okay? We have a creator aspect within us, okay? and that is our thoughts. It has been said that the universe itself is mental. It is comprised of thought energy. Everything that we experience ultimately had to derive at some place in the past as a thought. Okay? A fork, a key implement. Okay? Someone had to think, I want to make something to be used as an eating implement and devise something that we now know as a fork. But the thought had to arise first. And this is with anything. Any action we take had to ultimately arise as a thought. Any piece of technology that we make had to arise as a thought. Any series of events that we experience had to exist first in the thoughts of the people that made that event occur. The second aspect of consciousness as it manifests in our reality is our emotions. Our emotions are the internal aspect of our consciousness. These are the ways that we basically express ourselves within the body, within our own body, in our own physical makeup. We express ourselves inside of us through how we feel. Okay? This is basically the thoughts coming into the body and then carrying a, an energy that is then expressed through the physiology and feel it in the physiology. And that's called our emotions. So that's the sacred feminine quality of our consciousness. You could look at it as the divine mother in this consciousness trinity. You have the creator aspect, and then you have the internal feminine motherly aspect. You know, our emotions are the spirit in which we do things, right? They're the spirit in which we do things. 
just like in Trinity, we call this aspect of the Holy Spirit. Right? So the thoughts, the root, the essence, the primary essence of consciousness, and that is the creator aspect. The emotion, the internal feminine aspect of consciousness, that's the spirit aspect. Okay, so we have the mind, and now we have the spirit. And then the third quality of consciousness, the third aspect, is our action. What we actually do with what we know in our mind, the thought aspect, and what we carry within us in our emotional makeup, our spirit. Both of these two things then create a synthesis called our behavior, the actions that we take in the world in relation to others. And this is the child of our thoughts and our emotions. So if we look at the thoughts as a creator aspect of our consciousness, that um, basically expresses the mind, we look at the emotions as the sacred feminine quality of our consciousness that expresses the spirit. We can look at our actions as the divine child or the byproduct of these two other qualities of consciousness that basically determines what we do and how we interact with others in the world. And this is the divine child. And the actions are, again, it's the yang quality of consciousness, which is a masculine energy. So we can look at this as a divine male child. Hopefully some people will see where I'm going with this analogy and breakdown. This is the trinity. This is the creator. This is the divine mother and the divine child. Okay? And the divine mother could also be considered it's too the far spirit, away. the Holy Spirit. So, this also gives us the mind, body, and the spirit connection. And our thoughts are how the mind manifests, the actions are what we do with our body, and the emotions are our internal quality and our internal makeup, the sacred feminine quality, which is our spirit, the spirit in which we do things. This uh, concept that I have just described in different mystical traditions has been called the law of three or the triune aspect of human life. Triune means three in one. Three in one. And of course, you can see the, uh, the uh, analogy to different mystical traditions and different uh, religious notions of a trinity in many different cultures. So, the next thing that I want to talk about here tonight is how these three qualities express inside the human physiology. And this is critical toward understanding how people are manipulated. And if we don't get any, any uh, callers, if we have some callers that are going to call in, we have to call in one more time. If we uh, do get callers, I will take some calls during this hour. If we don't get callers, I'm just going to uh, continue to get into the physiological aspects of consciousness through a breakdown of the human brain for the rest of the show. So if we get some callers, maybe we'll take some. If not, I'll just continue on with uh, an analysis of the physiology uh, and the human brain and how that relates with our consciousness, and that's what we'll do for the remainder of this show. So, the human brain is part of the discovery of self. Yet, if you go to an average person on the street, or in your family, or your other friends, many people do not really understand what they carry in between their own ears. They don't understand any of the components, they don't understand the makeup of the brain, they don't understand how the brain works, they don't understand what qualities of their personalities the different components of the brain drives or gives rise to. And this is extremely and exceedingly sad 
because if somebody doesn't understand how the most sacred gift that they have ever been given, I would say, aside from free will, but let's put it this way, this is how your free will manifests itself. If you don't have a brain, you're really not going to be able to manifest much free will. So I think the greatest gift that we're ever really given in the universe is our free will. And um, I think to understand um, the human brain is to really understand ourselves and how uh, we are a gifted species by even possessing a brain of the order and magnitude that we do have. So that's why it's critical for our understanding of what's going on in the world, to understand what is going on in our own brain. And the first way we need to do that is by basically understanding basic structures within the brain. I'm not going to get super technical, and I'm not going to go into any kind of high-level neuroscience. All I want to do is basically break down some of the structures in the brain and get people to understand how these structures are directly connected and tied with fundamental human motivations. Okay? So, the oldest part of the human brain and the, the simplest structures of the human brain are in the lowest parts of the brain. The actual height-wise, the lowest part. Now, think about how interesting that is. It's like saying a foundation of a house, which is the part that is laid down first, is at the lowest level of the house. Of course, that's true, okay? because you can't build something on top of it if you don't have a foundation there to begin with. So this base part of the brain is called the R-complex. The R-complex. Letter R, word complex. The letter R stands for reptilian. Reptilian complex. Otherwise, more simply called the reptile brain. So, right there, most people were unaware. You, inside of you, have a reptile brain. You do. This part of the brain is the, the controller of physical activity. <clears throat> Motor skills are controlled by the R-complex of the brain. The R-complex is basically two components. It's the brain stem, which connects to the spinal column. <clears throat> Behind that, near the back of the head, <clears throat> there is a region called the cerebellum. These two components of the brain govern motor skills. They govern motor skills. Without this part of the brain, you would not be able to move. <coughs> you would not be able to move your arms and legs. You would not be able to walk. You would not be able to talk. You would not be able to basically do anything that involves moving any of the muscles of your body. So it's a critically important part of the brain. You need this part of the brain to do anything in the world, basically. However, it governs some basic primitive behaviors that we all experience and display at one point or another in our lives. This part of the brain governs the fight or flight mechanisms of the consciousness. See, when we were a less evolved being, we engaged predators that we had to make a decision about. Did we have enough ability to stand and fight them, given the situation or the tools or weapons that we had? Or would we have to flee from them in order to survive? Because this part of the brain, the R complex, is all about survival. It's all about what we need to do to survive. It governs eating. Okay, sleeping. Anything that we need to do to survive in the physical world that we live in. And the fight or flight response is about 
what we do when our survival is threatened. What happens during this state of mind, this fight or flight response, is the heart begins to pump blood very quickly. And it's pumping it away from two areas of the body and toward two other areas of the body. Okay? So when we go into fight or flight response, which is otherwise called stress. This is commonly referred to in the modern world as stress. Okay? When we go into this modality of consciousness, the, the R complex of the brain sends instructions to the human heart, and it says pump blood faster. Pump it away from the torso and the head. Now think about that. Blood begins to pump vigorously away from the torso and the head. So in the torso is all of our vital organs. In the head is the brain. Okay? So richly oxygenated blood is not being sent during times of stress, otherwise called fight or flight response, it is not being sent actively to the torso or to the head, to the brain. Why? Well, during times of making a decision about whether you're going to fight or run away, once that decision is made, you're choosing either to stand and fight or to run because you're you're under, uh, you're in a situation where you're being preyed upon. You don't need blood in those areas of the body. That's not the top of the priority in that given situation. Blood needs to go to the extremities. You're not going to sit and do any conceptual thinking if you're under attack by, let's say, a mountain lion. You're not going to think about deep conceptual ideas or philosophical ideas. You're also not going to do much digestion in that state or any other functions that the internal organs go to work on to process, uh, uh, to process uh, uh, food and other, uh, other nutrients in the body. That's not a priority either at that time. What is a priority? What is a priority in a state of consciousness like that is you need to either have a lot of energy in your arms because you're going to need to be using them to fight off your attacker. So your arms muscles have to, have to uh, get all of that rich oxygenated blood so that it can become hard and that they can have energy to be wielded as weapons in the battle that you're about to have. Conversely, if you make the decision to run away, lots of rich, richly oxygenated blood needs to drive the muscles of your legs so that you can flee the situation as fast as possible in order to survive. If, now, think about that in, in um, strategic survival terms. It makes so much sense. It makes so much sense once we understand that that's the mechanism that is really going on in our bodies, and that the brain is driving that, right? You don't need to go to the head or towards the head on the moment of attack. You need to be expressed so you can either fight or run away. Now, that makes sense in a situation where you're fighting an attacker or a mountain. However, in the modern world, where do we see this happening most frequently? We're not really in many situations where we actually physically need to make a decision to fight somebody or to flip, okay? In, in certain instances, yes, that is the case. But in general, where this, this um, mechanism of the brain is activating and going to work most frequently is when we are engaged in stressful activities. And... We're almost always in 
particularly Western cultural uh, life. So, unfortunately, this places us at an even greater disadvantage. This is actually an advantageous survival adaption technique in the brain, which has become a detriment in modern society because what we're doing with this function is we're essentially staying in most of the days, most of the hours of the day, days that we live. We are staying in this construct of consciousness. We're living in the reptile brain most of the time. Most people are living in the reptile brain most of the time because we're, it's one thing to the next, a hectic, busy lifestyle, a job, dealing with children, uh, dealing with physical tasks and activities, traffic, other people during the day that we don't want to deal with and interact with. It's a constant struggle and a constant engaging in the reptile brain. And this is what we call stress. Now, in a context where there is no ability to either fight or run away, and therefore use it and then go back to normal brain function, we're essentially trapped in that reptile brain throughout most of our lives as a culture. And this does very harmful things to the other structures of the brain, which I'm going to get into in uh, the last 15 or 20 minutes of the show today. So the, ma the mammal brain is the next part of the brain I'm going to talk about. So we have a reptile brain, and it's the base brain, and it governs survival and fight or flight response. Okay? The mammal brain, also called the limbic system, the limbic system, governs our emotional makeup. It governs Yama. the chemical interactions through which we experience our emotions. Okay, the limbic brain governs the chemical interactions through which we experience what we call our emotions. Again, the sacred feminine internally felt quality of consciousness. Okay? So our emotional makeup is largely directed through. It's, it's not derived by, it doesn't come into being because of, the, the limbic brain or the mammal brain, but that's how the emotions basically get to uh, a place where they can affect the physiology and act through the mammal brain and the limbic brain. And this is the sacred feminine part of the brain. This is called the midbrain. In some uh, occult traditions, they call it the middle chamber. The middle chamber, some people will recognize that uh, uh, concept. So without this part of the brain, we could feel no emotions. Think of it in relation to a reptile who doesn't have a mammal brain, a mammalian brain. They only have a reptilian brain. They are a creature of instinct. Again, survival. Cold-bloodedness is a feature of a reptile. They don't really experience emotions the way mammals experience emotions. Just consider a crocodile in relationship to a dog or a chimpanzee. A dog and a chimpanzee really experience emotional states that are quite different than a crocodile. A crocodile is largely a creature of instinct. Well, you can see a chimpanzee become sad or a dog become sad and many other emotional states. Now, that's what we share in common. We share these two brains in common with different species in the animal kingdom, with reptiles and with mammals. There's a part of the brain that really makes us unique and actually in a higher level of organization and consciousness, and that is the human brain. And this is what most people think of when they think of the brain. They think of the gray matter, the gray matter part of the brain. And this is, this is basically called the telencephalon. The gray matter section of the brain is called the telencephalon. The part of the brain where most of the neural activity takes place for human thought is in the outer portion 
the outer layer of the telencephalon. And this is called the human neocortex, the neocortex. This part of the brain governs all higher order thinking of an individual. Every quality that really makes us human, we have as a result of having a highly developed neocortex. The neocortex is bilaterally symmetrical, and I've already talked a bit about this and brought up a little bit about the left and right brain. Sug, sug. We have a left brain and a right brain. The left brain is the male aspect of the brain. It, it governs analytical thought, logic, scientific thought, mathematical thought. It governs um, the, our use of words and language. Okay, so the left brain hemisphere, these are all the functions that it deals with, that it makes possible. And th this is the neocortex we're talking about, the higher brain. order thought Low center power. of the brain. All the functions that really make us human and separate us from the other animals, this is the part of the brain that governs those functions. The other side of the human neocortex is called the right brain. This is the yin energy, the feminine quality of the, of the human makeup can be found uh, by looking into the functions of the right brain. The right brain governs um, intuition, simple knowing, without really understanding oh, how one knows, the, the gut feeling, what do you you know, an intuitive quality. It governs creativity. So the way we express our thoughts and emotions through art, through music, through uh, all other forms of creative expression, creative Down. writing and dance and things like that. We're really engaging the right brain when we engage in creative uh, ideas and creative activities. And then uh, holistic thought, you know, the idea that we are essentially one, that there is relationship between us and others and that we're not separate. This idea largely derives out of the right brain functions. And this is why we say when we talk about the right brain, we're in our right mind or we're not in our right mind. We don't have a connection to this part of the brain. We're not really in our right mind, so to speak. It's not just a, uh, a play on words. It actually has a basis in the fundamental physiology of the human brain. So if we go back to the uh, metaphor that I started talking about earlier in this show, we talk about consciousness and how it has a threefold oh, aspect. Oh. Well, just as consciousness has a threefold aspect, our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions, our brain also has a triune nature. And they call scientists uh, and, and uh, neuroscientists call this the triune brain. It's the three in one again, triune. Okay, you have the reptile brain, the mammal brain, and the human brain. We are basically three beings in one. And there is a hierarchy to this. There is a way that information should be processed according to this threefold or triune <clears throat> system if it is functioning properly. And by functioning properly, what I mean by that is a balance between the left and right brain hemispheres. This is called global EEG coherence in scientific terms. Okay? In neuroscience, that's what they call it. It means that your left brain and right brain hemispheres are both firing in unison and in harmony. And the neural activity and the electrochemical uh, synaptic activity is fully working and is fully alive and lit up in all the hemispheres, in both hemispheres of the brain, all across the hemispheres. In other words, this is a brain that is firing on all cylinders, so to speak. It is a lit up mind. It is a person who lives in balance within themselves. And as such, they are capable of really living in balance with others and with their environment. 
See, the human brain is designed to be the executive command center of the whole brain complex. It is the part of the brain, again, that deals with higher order thought. You could look at it as if you have a company, you have a, a, a CEO of a company, you have a person that really makes the critical executive decisions. Well, this part of the brain governs reason, and it governs the way we use our actions in balance with our emotions. So if we have a balanced neocortex, and not one side dominates the other, we don't have a, an imbalance to the left brain hemisphere, and we don't have an imbalance to the right brain hemisphere, we become a person that is capable of higher order thought conceptual thinking and reasonable behavior, meaning behavior that is governed by through the ability to reason and recognize patterns and recognize meaning with respect to patterns. This is the greatest gift that our species possesses. There is no more complex object in the known universe than the frontal portions of the human neocortex. None. It is the most advanced supercomputer that, pro that we will probably ever know of or discover. This is the most advanced computer that exists and it is the most complex substance that we know of. And it's sitting right behind your eyes. Think about that. Okay? Now, if that part of the brain is working properly, we are in touch with the sacred feminine component of the, the brain structures, which is the limbic brain or the mammal brain, otherwise called the midbrain. This is always sending data upward toward the neocortex. Okay? Think about it. The spiritual part of the brain, the sacred feminine part of the brain that governs our emotions is always trying to send data upward to the reasoning functions of the brain, the, the, the logical and analytical left brain and the creative nurturing and, and intuitive right brain, always receiving instructions from the midbrain. Okay? So if, if, if the brain is functioning properly, that's how it works. And then, through the neocortex, we'll send instructions back down to the motor centers of the brain, the rep reptile brain, so that we use our actions governed by reason. Okay? Think about how this works. Really let it absorb. This is critical information to understand if we under are going to understand how we work we don't understand how we work, we're completely subject to manipulation and mind control. And this is ultimately about becoming a being that governs oneself and is not subjected to the control of the mind through other people attempting to usurp and control one's mind and behavior. That's what this is ultimately about. And if we're going to do that, we have never to understand dull. how we work. And one of the best ways to do this is to understand the basics of neuroscience function and the basic structures of the human brain. So, what happens when we're constantly in the reptile brain? What happens when we're either imbalanced toward one brain hemisphere or the other brain hemisphere? Well, it's interesting because different things happen depending on the nature of the imbalance. And what I'll start to get into a little bit next week is I will talk about the different methodologies, the different methods of mind control that go to work on the different sides of the brain. Okay? Because it's a, these are targeted functions. These are targeted methodologies, the mind control that is used against us. And there's two big ones in particular, which I'll get into, and I will explain how one of them goes to work on the left brain, 
One of them goes to work on the right brain. One of them holds back the left brain. One of them holds back the right brain. So these, these methodologies of mind control are geared and devised Speak, to throw friend. people into one state of imbalance or the other, either completely left brain functions or completely uh, dwelling in right brain. Go forth, and this is a dangerous trap to fall into, and I would say 95% or better of people really are in one of these states of imbalance or another, either imbalance toward the left brain hemisphere or the right Please brain hemisphere. Friend. So I think um, uh, what I'll basically uh, do to wrap this show up, I think uh, instead of trying to get into all of that right now, um, let's leave it where we have it for now. I'm uh, kind of a little bit disappointed that we didn't get to take any callers, but uh, unfortunately it looks like no one called into the switchboard. Uh, let's see if we could uh, uh, get some callers in next week. I'd really be happy to take some of your calls and get some of your thoughts on these ideas. But for now, I'm going to uh, wrap it up here and um, uh, just give you some of the uh, websites where you can listen to this show and many other great shows as well. Uh, an, uh, another big thanks to Bob Tuscan for getting me started on the Revolution Broadcasting Network. Uh, his show is um, is uh, going to be uh, coming up uh, in in uh, at, at 10 p.m. on the East Coast. And uh, um, my website, you can go to and check out some of these ideas and listen to uh, and watch uh, many hours of presentations and uh, lectures about these concepts and many others. I get into uh, all of the breakdown of consciousness. I get into the methods of mind control. I get into solutions. That's ultimately what we're going to talk about as we go forward on this radio show. And uh, my website is whatonearthishappening.com. Whatonearthishappening.com. I'll be here every Tuesday and Thursday night on Revolution Broadcasting at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Catch you next time. Thank you for listening. Freedom, man.